Well, hello, everyone. It's uh, Mark Mallory here from the Sussex Ornithological Society. Uh, I hope you can all see me. Um, good evening. Um, this event will last about 40 minutes. Um, the talk will last about 40 minutes. And then after that, there'll be about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. We hope to get through all the questions. If we don't manage to do that, you will be able to see them afterwards, uh, the answers. Um, and we'll tell you at the end how to do that. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Marcus Ward. Marcus is the co-founder of the Wild New Forest uh, organization. He's also the chair of the Hampshire Ontological Society's uh, scientific committee. So I'm going to pass over to you uh, in just a moment. He's uh, almost good to go. Um, before we do start, I thought some of you might be wondering why anywhere in southern England deserves the uh, prefix wild. And um, so I had a word with Marcus about that, and he gave me a few stories which explain that. And uh, on one occasion, he'd been doing some nocturnal surveying. And as he was walking back to his car, he came to a clearing. And in that clearing were some strange white clad figures, all in white with white hoods and white robes. And uh, he'd come across a pagan ritual in the middle of the forest. And of course, he bade them good evening, uh, as he would. Um, but he got the impression that he'd interrupted something rather important. So um, he rather sort of, uh, he felt a bit sheepish, I expect, and sort of walked back to his car. But he, he survived unscathed, and they were entirely friendly pagans, I'm happy to say. So it can be a pretty wild place. Um, but uh, anyway, over to Marcus, and thank you very much for joining us, Marcus. Uh, you'll just need to unmute. Oh, okay. Thank you. I hope everybody can, can hear me. Um, so welcome. So um, this evening I'm going to talk about the new forest. Um, so before we, before we get started, I'll just, just point out where, where, we, where we're talking about. The new forest here in Hampshire, so it's sort of bordered by Southampton um, to the east, Bournemouth to the west, um, Salisbury to the north, and the Solent um, to the south. Um, a lot of our fieldwork and um, studies are, are focused on the central New Forest area. So if I talk about the central New Forest area, that's the, the block of woodland in the middle there, so bordered by Lyndhurst, Brockenhurst and Burley. Um, so before I start, I'll just talk a little bit about Wild New Forest and who we are. Um, I mean, I've been, I've been birding and doing fieldwork in the New Forest uh, for, for a number of years, nearly 20 years, um, studying various species. Um, and it started in 2009, I was doing a Farcrest survey with uh, a mate of mine, Russell Wynn, <laughs> and it became apparent, we kept on bumping into other people doing field work here, there and everywhere. Um, it became apparent there's a lot of people doing a lot of work in the New Forest, but uh, being, being birders and being, being a little bit grumpy as us as, as birders often are, we didn't really commu communicate with each other all that well. Um, so we decided to establish Wild New Forest in 2016 as a way, as a means of um, pulling together field workers in the New Forest. And it started off with a monthly pub meeting uh, where we get to pick, get together with uh, people doing field work and, and representatives from the Forestry Commission and other bodies so we could just talk about what we're doing. Uh, generally would end up as a bit of a gossip session but um, it's a good way of communicating what is what is going on and, and sharing best practice and, and what we're all up to as individuals. And um, so subsequently it, it sort of grew an awful lot from there. We set up a, a Facebook page which currently has over 5,000 members. Um, so it's a good place to go and look if you want to see what's going on currently in, in the New Forest. Um, and in 2019, we set it up as a community interest company. Um, so with, with the intent of doing a, a, a bit of outreach um, and to generate to, as, a, as a method to generate some funds to support um, field work that we're doing in the forest. So what I'll do, Oh, I'm conscious that we, this is a relatively short talk this evening, so I'll, I'll try and go through as quickly as possible, as concisely as possible. But the first species group that I'm going to talk about is firecrest. Um, so we've been studying firecrest in the New Forest since 2009. Um, a little bit of background about firecrest in the New Forest. Um, they were first established or first recorded as a breeding species in the New Forest in 1962. 
Um, the first UK nest was found at Boulderwood, um, which still to this day remains the stronghold of the species in, in the forest. And it's sort of rather delightful that the chap that, that found and recorded that first net, nest, a chap called Mike Adams, is still very active in the forest today, still doing field work for Firecrest, and we've been working quite closely with him. Um, from that first breeding attempt in 62, the population did grow. Um, but what we picked up on is that it, it grew uh, considerably at the turn of the century. Um, it's something that us as local birders would discuss a lot, but we, we couldn't really pin, pin down what was going on. So we established a survey in 2009 um, that was repeated every year to 2011 and then again in 2014 to 2016. It was due to be repeated again last year, but because of COVID um, it was pushed back and again this year it's going to be pushed back to 2022. So. Uh, we've still got a, a while to wait for the latest results. But what we, what we wanted to find out, our key questions were, what is the new forest population? Is it still growing? Um, are Firecrest and Goldcrest impacted by hard winters? What's their spatial and temporal distribution in the forest? And where do they go in winter? I mean, at that time in 2009, when we started, there were no Firecrest wintering in the new forest. Roll forward to today and it's, it's hard to go anywhere in the forest during the winter and not come across a firecrest. So the situation has changed quite dramatically. Um, so I'm just going to just quickly show you some results. Uh, this is from the Central New Forest block. This is part of the survey that we did was to survey each of the 46 square kilometres in that central block to within 100 metres of every square, following the same route with the same surveyor um, each year plotting um, singing firecrests on a map, territorial firecrests. Um, so it's just two of us doing this. Uh, and then latterly, we were joined by, by a chap called Rob Clements, who also helped out. Um, so this is just a small snapshot of the data. 2009, the survey revealed 104 singing male firecrests. Now, at that time, we thought that was fantastic. It was a, a large number. But uh, rolling forward to 2016, that number had increased to 498 singing firecrest. Um, you can see there on the map, and it's not, not that easy to sort of compare to, to where these places are in reality, but in the, in the top right corner of that 2016 map, sorry, top left corner, you can see the number 39. So that's a square kilometre that had 39 singing male firecrest. Um, that still to this day remains the, the busiest, most densely populated square in the forest for Firecrest. And that is in fact the square that Mike Adams first found that nest in, in 1962. So it still remains a stronghold for the species uh, in that area. Marcus? And it's worth, yes. Marcus, Marcus, could you switch your, some people want to see you, you're very handsome. So could you switch your camera on? Sure. <laughs> uh, you can. Uh, cool. There okay. you go. Cool. Is that all right? Yep. Okay, so um, uh, uh, let's just move this, is blocking the screen for me, so let me just shrink that, there we go. Um, so, um, as I say, this is just the central, central part of the New Forest, so if we were to extrapolate out based on, on, on our knowledge of suitable and similar habitat, that would give us in 2016 a population of between 1,500 and 2,000 firecrest in the New Forest, so it's quite a remarkable total. Um, again, we, we feel the population has continued to increase, but that rate of increase has slowed um, a little. So we're, we're keen to repeat that survey in, in it will be in 2022. Uh, we'll get the, get the next set of results. So I'll just talk a little bit about firecrest, because firecrest are fantastic little, uh, little birds. I'm very heavily attached to them. Um, they're aggressive little blighters. This at the moment is a good time of year to go out and see them because uh, within the next week or two they'll start establishing their territories. They start singing from late February through through March, and they get uh, they get so so uh, territorial um, they can end up in in, um, in battle quite frequently. This picture is a bit of a rubbish picture, but I just thought I'd, I'd talk through this because this was one of my special moments with Firecrest. I was uh, up in in Boulderwood, funnily enough, stood in between two Firecrest singing in holly trees either side of me. Uh, the singing was getting more and more intense. And suddenly it kind of reached a crescendo and these two firecrest exited their holly trees and came and had this aerial battle, literally centimetres in front of my nose, uh, that seemed to go on for hours, but in reality it was probably just two or three seconds. 
and then they fell to the floor and carried on scrapping away uh, again, uh, probably for, for only seconds, but it seemed like longer, before returning to their respective holly bushes and blasting out their song again. Um, so it is, it is a great time to go out and see Firecrest when they're establishing their territories and when we haven't got so much leaf cover. Um, so I'd, I'd definitely recommend it. It's a good time to go and see them. Um, and this is just a cracking picture that I had to share. This is a picture by Ollie Frampton. And this maybe partly explains why their numbers are increasing so much. Firecrests have uh, huge broods um, uh, and they appear to be very successful. Um, so from um, sort of mid, mid to late July, you can go out and come across uh, noisy firecrest all across the forest. And for the first maybe five to seven days, they'll be hanging around in quite a tight knit family group. And you can often see them gathered on a branch. Often where they're gathered is difficult to get a picture of uh, because it's covered in foliage and so on. So Ollie did a fantastic job with that one. Um, so I'm just going to quickly talk a little bit about firecrest ringing as well. So we did a bit of colour ringing of firecrests in the forest. Um, I'll just skip back to that last slide because it shows the, the combinations that we used. We, we started off first of all colour ringing breeding birds, but we didn't really learn all, all that much more than, than was already known from that. So we switched to um, in 2014, when birds started wintering in the forest, we switched to targeting a handful of uh, very targeted wintering birds, just to understand what they're go what's going on and what their movements are. Um, so rather than talk about the thing all in, I'm going to pick on an individual, which is, which is my, my favourite one. I make no bones about this one. This is a, a firecrest that we ringed on the 4th of January 2015. Um, and if anybody knows the New Forest, it was in Hollies, immediately adjacent to the Boulderwood car park, which is probably one of the biggest honeypot sites in the New Forest, it's extremely busy with visitors. Um, so this, this firecrest was ringed just by um, a holly tree. Um, and his history there, as you can see, this is an abridged version of his history, but it was recorded throughout, all the way through to 25th of September, 19, uh, 2017 was the last time uh, I recorded him. Uh, in that whole time, I, every time I went there, he was always in the same couple of holly bushes. He never went anywhere. I, I watched him live his life, um, have three broods, um, and aggressively defend his territory against every other firecrest in the area. And uh, he had a chip on his shoulder about tree creepers, couldn't stand tree creepers, um, but was quite tolerant of goldcrests and some tits. Um, but it was amazing. I'd stand there next to this, this heaving car park Full of uh, people having picnics and playing cricket and whatnot. Um, seeing bird watchers come and go off looking for firecrests in the forest, oblivious that they're walking past this one. Um, but what is interesting, I mean, it's, it's great to it's great to have an attachment with an individual. But what it did tell us is is that they're not really moving anywhere. So this this in 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 the firecrest world is fairly suboptimal habitat, nesting in a sparse holly tree next to a busy car park. Um, but he adopted that territory and kept him. We had a similar story with, with the dozen or so other firecrests that we, we targeted and colour ringed, um, behaved in a, in a very similar way. Um, so a bit about finding firecrests. Uh, this is based on the New Forest, but I think it would hold good for anywhere you go. Um, in the New Forest, their stronghold is, is Boulderwood. So other good places are uh, Rhinefield Ornamental Drive, or they're, they're pretty widespread across the whole area. Their favourite habitats are soft conifers, so that's sort of spruce and um, Douglas fir. They also like yew, um, areas of holly. They start singing from late February and all the way through to mid-June. You'll get some that carry, do carry on singing beyond that, but the majority stop in late June. And a good time to see them is when they're establishing their territories in March and April. But do bear in mind they're a schedule one species, so you have to give them space and, and, and be mindful of where they're nesting. Their nests are generally very inaccessible. Uh, but what I'm going to do is um, play a little bit of song. Um, so when we were doing the field work, we would use uh, their song to detect the bird. And I think probably 99% of the firecrests I see today are detected on song or call. It's a very distinctive song, far carrying. Um, and I've, I've intentionally put songs in this talk because I'm terrible at mimicking birds. So I'll just play firecrest. I hope everybody can hear this.
So it's a, it's quite a far carrying, quite a strong song, I would say, for a small bird with that rising rising in pitch as it goes through. Uh, just to, to to give a comparison, I'll play the Goldcrest song, uh, which is um, some some say is similar. So you can see by comparison, the gold crest is sort of up and down, a little bit maybe more melodic, um, but it's also very softer. It doesn't carry as far. So just to clarify, I'll just play one more little burst of fire crest. So that's that's what to listen out for if you want to go fire crest hunting, and probably in the next couple of weeks they should start singing. So um, that's oops. I'm going to move on to Hawfinch. Uh, so we'll get Hawfinch out of the way because that's the one I tend to get stuck on. I, uh, I, I adore Hawfinches. I'm absolutely obsessed with them. Uh, they're very much my, uh, my pet um, project. I've been studying Hawfinches in the forest now for about 10 years and it came about from that Firecrest survey, um, doing Firecrests, seeing Hawfinches, getting fascinated by them but not really understanding them. Um, so a little bit of background about Hawfinch in the UK. Um, the short story is that it's, it's declined terribly. You can see here um, uh, the BTO breeding atlas on the left hand side there, um, 1968 to 1972 atlas um, shows it never numerous but fairly widespread across um, the southern half of the UK. Uh, rolling forward to the 2008 to 2011 um, atlas, you can see pretty much gone from the heartlands of the UK. And we've just some remaining strongholds, and those strongholds being uh, up in the northwest um, in Lancashire. Uh, there's a little stronghold in Snowdonia where they have some good numbers, and in the Forest of Dean and the Wye Valley. And then, of course, here in the New Forest. Um, we had a meeting with the RSPB back in uh, 2010, 2011, I think, and um, to discuss this. And what became apparent from that meeting is how little we know about hawfinch. So, to save you all, uh, I, I, what I'm going to do, I've, we've been doing lots of hawfinch, lots of various different tactics we've applied to understand them from breeding to wintering, roosting and all sorts. So I'm going to just focus on a couple of things, a couple of projects we've done um, on hawfinch in the new forest. So first of all, I'm going to talk about GPS radio tracking. So this is something we did in 2019. Um, a, a small group of us, um, you can see Andrew Cohen up there at the bottom of the, of the radio tracker, he was a core, core part of the team. Um, we got um, 10 lightweight GPS radio tags um, that have only a very short lifetime and they're attached to the, onto the back of the Hawfinch. Uh, you can see the tag there in the top left picture there is, is the uh, satellite tag. So it's a combined satellite GPS and radio tracking tag. Um, and what we do, we put a little dab of glue on it and attach it to the shaft of one of the feathers on the small of the back of a, of, of a hawfinch is, is very flat. There's a very flat area. Um, so we put just, amount of, just about the right amount of glue on there for it to, to stay on for a few weeks and then just fall off naturally. Um, that's probably the hardest part of the whole thing is getting the right amount of glue. Because um, you, you don't want it to stay on for too long and also you don't want it to fall off the second the bird flies away. So the tags picked up a, a made a GPS connection once every 20 minutes to plot a location, um, and then um, they um, we we also tracked them with radio tracking, um, and then ultimately the tag would fall off, and then we'd use the radio tracker to locate the tag in the undergrowth somewhere and uh, retrieve the data. Um, so this is an overview of all the birds we tagged. It's, quite a busy screen so don't worry about it too much but in the top centre you can see the red cross that's where we um, tagged all of the birds um, and then each of the individual of the 10 birds are there in colour but rather than uh, dwell on all that I'm going to focus on one individual which is this chap um, he's an adult male hawfinch that was first ringed in 2018 there he's got a ring on that's DN. We changed his colour ring to IP when we uh, put the tag on. Um, the purpose of the survey, should I say, what, what we're trying to achieve with the tags is we're putting them on adult males in the breeding season. So the, the females during the breeding season sit on the nest and just 
uh, hang around the nest and, and sit on the eggs and sit with the chicks, whereas the male does all the, all the provision for the nest. So what we wanted to understand is where that male is foraging, uh, also where he's roosting um, and where he's, he's getting the food from to better understand the dynamics of, of, the, uh, of the area. So this is IP and this is his map um, for all the, all the um, fixes that we got from him. So I'll try and talk you through it a little bit. Um, in the bottom right, there's a red dot and that's where we put the tag on. That's where we caught him and applied the tag. Uh, and then he flew soon after, or 20 minutes later, he's in a place called Bratley Arch, which is an area of beach. Uh, and then he hopped across into Bratley Wood, which is where that big cluster of dots is. Um, sorry, that's Bratley Enclosure. Um, and that's where his nest was. And that's where he spent the vast majority of his time. And when we were radio tagging, tracking, that's all we picked him up, always in Bratley Enclosure. But when we downloaded the data from the tag, we were amazed to see that he'd been making all these trips up to the top right here. Now that's, uh, was very unexpected. And that's an area of hollies. I'll just skip on to the next slide. Um, so where he was nesting, you can see here on the on the left, this is Bratley enclosure. So his nest was in a mature oak. Um, he also roost, roosted in Bratley enclosure. Um, quite a few of our hawfinches will join a communal roost um, and go off and roost with other hawfinches. But this particular in individual hung around the uh, nest site, probably because there isn't a communal roost all that close to this site. So he stayed and roosted in an ivy clad oak overnight, not far from the nest. And that's where he spent most of his time. But then he did this journey of 1.7 kilometers. Generally looking at the data, it was always kind of early in the morning, late in the afternoon, up to this area in the bottom right. And this is Fridham Cross, which is, to be honest, is if you're walking across the forest, you'd kind of blink and miss it. It's this little group of hollies right next to the dual carriageway. So it's not a pleasant place to visit. It's quite noisy. Um, and it is just a group of hollies. And so what, what we believe he was doing is going to feed uh, himself in the hollies. Um, so while he was breeding, he would be in the oak in Bratley and he'd be able to find plenty of food in there, feeding in, uh, his youngsters invertebrate food, um, as we'll look in, in the next slide. But hawfinches uh, do favour uh, a seed-based diet. So we believe he was heading across to uh, three of them cross to feed on hollies and that's kind of similar to what we found in most of most of the hawfinches that we tagged that a preference for going to feed at the beginning of the day and the end of the day in these areas of holly. So a bit about hawfinch feeding on the back of that. Um, what we've learned is what we've kind of suspected for a long time that holly is a favoured staple for new forest hawfinch uh, but also when it's in season they'll feed on beech and hornbeam. Um, we've got lots of beech in the forest, but hardly any hornbeam. Uh, hornbeam is quite a rare uh, tree species in the forest, it's just got a couple of areas. Uh, they seem to readily switch to in-season crops like rowan or mountain ash. Um, they generally feed on the ground. Um, and what we found, particularly by studying them in the hollies, that they'll follow winter thrushes to consume defecated or regurgitated seed. And that's what I've learned. I've learned. I've learned to sort of love hawfinches, but also have a little bit of disdain for them at the same time. And you know, they're they're fantastic, but they drive me nuts. Um, and it, so it doesn't surprise me to find that they go around sort of sifting through red wing poo to look for seeds because it's easier than having to remove all the flesh from the berry itself. Um, so just the pictures on on the left here, we've got fallen holly berries. Um, which I'm sure we are all well aware of what they look like, but in the bottom there, each holly berry uh, has four little seeds in it. And it's these little seeds that the hawfinches are after. So if you go to, if you go to a, a holly home anywhere after a red wing or field fair flock has, has moved through, often you'll find these little seeds scattered all over the place. And that's what the hawfinches are after. Um, we did uh, do a side analysis. So uh, we were working with a PhD student from Cardiff who was analysing hawfinch feces. Um, so through those couple of years, I had a freezer full of hawfinch poo, um, along with all the other random things that I pick up and end up in our fridge and freezer at home. <laughs> Makes me very popular. Um, but the analysis from that, we've just got initial results so far. So we, 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 it's still very much a working process, but the initial data that I've been fed back is that of all the samples, oak appeared in 79% of the samples. Now we presume that's oak buds that the hawfinches were eating that we know they, they like to consume. 
56% had holly, 56% had beech, and then uh, almost 100% had uh, invertebrates uh, as well. Uh, and the most frequent of those were these four species of moth. Uh, so three, uh, sorry, two micro moths and two macro moths, uh, the Dunbar and the winter moth. And these are all species that at that time of year, the larvae are out uh, and favor oak. Um, so that, that goes to show that they're foraging in oak for larvae. So another bit, I'll just talk about this very quickly. Another area that I'm kind of obsessed with, some would say, is hawfinch roosting. Um, so I've been monitoring hawfinch roosts across the forest for about 10 years now, and uh, we've found 42 roosts across the forest. Um, so this is a typical hawfinch roost, not the best of pictures, but um, uh, this is one in the west of the forest. If you focus on the uh, Douglas fir in the middle at the back, the tallest one, the next picture, this is zoomed in on that. Um, so this was the next picture I took, which is zoomed in. And you can see this is typical hawfinch behaviour here, coming out of roost in the conifers and gathering. We've got, uh, I believe from memory, about 13 hawfinches in this picture. That roost on that day uh, actually had 56 hawfinches, uh, but this is fairly typical that they would gather in this group of you know, 15 or so, and then they'd head off in noisy squabbling groups. Um, so this is, a, this is just a quick overview of all the roosts that we found in the forest. So as, as I say, there's 42 in all. Uh, this map is actually a little bit out of date. There's an extra one to add on here. So all the red dots are roosts that we know of and are being monitored. Uh, the blue dots are roosts that we know or suspect are there, but we haven't quite pinned them down as yet. So there's still a bit of work to do. Um, at the beginning, I would monitor all of these roosts once a month, every month. But clearly, if you do the maths, now we've got 42. That's just, just impossible. Um, so now what I do, I monitor three. I've picked three roosts that we monitor every month, year round. And I've been doing that for the three roosts for 10 years now. So that, that creates some quite useful data. Um, so I'm just going to show you this very busy slide, um, but this is uh, this is actually nine years of data from one roost uh, at Holm Hill, uh, which is near Acres Down in the New Forest. Um, but putting it all together, it gives you kind of a feel for what's going on. So there's a couple of things I can point out here. Uh, first of all, the main thing you can see the red line, which indicates 2017, uh, a massive peak in October 2017, and that's uh, related to the influx of four inches that we had that year, uh, which was a nationwide thing. Numbers quickly went down in the New Forest because it was a bad beach year, so there wasn't much to keep them here. Um, but also, you'll see in 2014 we had a similar influx. Um, generally, numbers at either end of the year are fairly stable. But what is interesting to record are these peaks in June. Um, so uh, when hawfinches have their young, they, they, uh, they hang around the nest for a couple of weeks, the, the natal site, and then they get moved on to a crash for a, for a short while, and then they go off and start using the roost. Um, so if in a good breeding season, the numbers of hawfinch in the roost increase quite considerably. Um, you can pick out hawfinches in the roost as they fly out, because just like adolescent humans, I suppose, they're a little bit squeaky um, and they do stand out. So you can you can pick them up as they fly over. Um, but it's interesting to see here, you can see in 2015 was a very good breeding season. Uh, 2012 was a good breeding season. Uh, 2017 was kind of okay, but that's it. So they've, they've been, uh, they've not had a tremendous run uh, in recent years. The numbers dip soon after in July and August, and that's because then the hawfinches go off to molt. Uh, when they molt, they change their uh, it's when they're changing their feathers for new ones, so they might drop, say, some primary feathers, maybe two at a time, uh, so that, then they lose a lot of their flight agility, so they tend to go very low profile and hard to find, and so they, they go very quiet at the roosts, um, and hence our counts are low. So this is just a quick video um, just to talk through. Normally in my, my thing I'd have an awful lot more about hawfinch, but I've kept, kept it to just this, but this is a good video to show a hawfinch at the nest. So this is a adult female hawfinch. Um, I thought it was a bit shaky, this is taking handheld on a little bridge camera, but um, you see the hawfinch the female going and sitting in the nest there. At this stage we know that there's just eggs in that nest. You can see in the bottom right here the adult male has just turned up, He's gone off again, we'll be back in a minute. Um, here he is, so the male comes in to feed the female, uh, you can see the colour difference there between the male and the female, and that's the easiest way to tell them apart in the field. I find, uh, you, you, you 
Brooks, it will say that their secondaries have a pale patch, which is absolutely true, but it's not so easy to pick up in the field. Um, and so that's it. And so when you're nest finding, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that food pass. You blink and you miss it, it's over in seconds, and that happens about every 40 minutes to one hour. So that's, that's why finding hawfinch nests is so hard. Um, so finding finding hawfinches, if you want to go out and look for hawfinches um, in the new forest, best places are in ancient deciduous woodland. Uh, anywhere where suitable habitat occurs in the new forest, you, you will have hawfinches. They roost generally in soft conifers. They favour to feed on beech, holly and yew in the new forest, uh, mainly because that's their food crops that we have most abundantly. Um, they're widespread, great areas of Denny Wood. Uh, that little video clip was taken in Denny Wood. Uh, Boulder Wood is our main study area, which has got a very high population as well. The best time to go and see them is probably from now until early April, um, because they get quite gregarious, a bit like the firecrest, I'm saying they get all het up and involved in the, in the, the pre-season um, shenanigans and they become quite obvious um, and it's a good time to go and see them. They're wary though, they're very wary birds so get to know the call because um, without fail you almost always hear them before you see them. So I'll just play a little snip of the call. It's not much. I hope everybody can hear that. So that's it. Um, and when you're, uh, when it's, it's hard enough to hear when it's isolated on its own, but when you're in a woodland and you've got singing, I don't know, black cap or song thrush and wrens and dunnocks around you, uh, it can really drown out. So it's good to get yourself tuned in to that call. Um, right, we'll move on and talk about, which are going to change scene and move out into the open areas and talk about breeding waders. So, at Wadley Forest, we've been studying waders for a long time in the forest. Uh, curlew in particular, we've all been a bit obsessed about curlews, particularly in the last four or five years. Um, but we had sort of a golden opportunity last year. So um, as we went down into lockdown in March last year, the new forest was shut down uh, quite heavily. All of the car parks were locked shut uh, and cut off. And so access was severely limited in the new forest. Uh, and initially people stuck to it, there weren't very many people around. And so Forestry Commission, or Forestry England, saw that as a golden opportunity to answer that eternal question about recreational disturbance on ground nesting raiders. And so uh, they commissioned Russ and myself to survey uh, 106 square kilometres of the forest. So we split that between us uh, and we surveyed it for Curly, Redshank, Snipe and Lapwing. Um, it was methodology was three visits to visit within 50 meters of all suitable habitat and then to do subsequent visits to assess productivity of curlew and lapwing. Um, it was it was blooming hard work. We generally did three hours after dawn, two hours before dusk every day to, to match their uh, peak periods. Uh, but because all the car parks were lost, were locked and, and Forestry Commission were concerned about uh, their reputation of having people out doing field work, uh, they asked us to cycle everywhere as well. Um, so that certainly got us all very fit last year. Uh, but the results were incredible. Um, and th those results are now influencing management uh, as we speak. We found that a number of curlew in particular nested close to uh, car parking areas. And um, I'll talk about that when we get onto curlew in just a second. So I'm getting carried away. Um, so this, another busy map, I'm afraid, but this, this map is just a brief, brief overview of where our breeding waders nested. So um, here all the blue dots are curlews, um, all the brown dots are snipe, uh, the green dots are lapwing and the red dots are redshank. Um, so what we'll do, we'll, we'll look at each one individually. Um, so we'll start, with, we'll start with curlew. So curlew, uh, so this is basically the 2020 data we're sort of analysing here. We mapped 48 territories. I believe of those, we found 45 nests uh, in all. Um, so pretty much all of them, we, we managed to pinpoint the nest so we could proper, properly monitor each one. Um, Curlia's nest in extensive open areas of damp heath and grassland. Um, and in the past 20 years, there's been a 66% decline of Curlia in the new forest. So it's quite a staggering and worrying statistic. Last year, 
um, of those 48 pairs, only four managed to fledge young. And interestingly, two of those four nested right next to what would normally be extremely busy car parks at Shatterford and Ocknell. Um, so those car parks were closed and they remained closed because of the care use. And it's, it's remarkable that they were the successful ones. Um, you know, we've done a lot of we've done a lot of studies with Curlew over the years, and, and you know we've we've discovered that predation is a significant issue with um, Curlew. Um, many three disturbance uh, disturbance is also an issue, but um, overnight uh, predation by badges and foxes and and the like. Um, I'll just quickly play their call. It sets the hair on the back of my neck on end. Um, so that's that's uh, Curly. Um, we'll move on quickly. I just 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 happened to see the time, and I see our, we're uh, we're thirty five minutes in already. So uh, this is uh, Lapwing. Um, so with Lapwing, we map sixty one territories. Um, numbers have declined dramatically in the New Forest, um, largely as an impact of the beast from the east a couple of years ago. Lapwing are widespread uh, species across the forest, like to nest in boggy margins and open dry heath. Their productivity is poor. Uh, with a lot of curlews, we find we lose them uh, at the egg stage. With lapwings, they seem to do quite well through the egg stage, but we lose a lot of the youngsters when they first uh, fledge. So there's quite high mortality of young lapwing. Uh, just a bit of an air call. It's their flight. Fantastic. Uh, next, we'll talk about uh, snipe. So snipe is, is, was the main species we were actually focusing on the, last year. Um, so there was quite hard work covering uh, the, the ground, getting through 50 metres of every bog and valley mire uh, was uh, quite hard going. Ended up very wet quite a lot of the time. Um, and I'm just glad there's nobody else there to video me falling in. Um, so they, they need nest deep in, in bogs and mires, as I say, uh, but they're quite selective over their habitat preference. They, they, uh, we, dis we soon discovered that there is quite specific their needs. They don't want it to be too vegetated, but or to have too little vegetation either. And there needs to be open areas where they can feed on exposed ground um, as well. They're most active at dawn and dusk. And, you know, we found 151 territories um, and you know, they, we, we haven't really got any data to compare that against to work out if that is stable or not, but I think that's that's a pretty good number. Pretty much wherever suitable snipe habitat occurred, we found snipe, uh, which suggests they're at a peak. Now we use two methods. So with, with lapwing, snipe and, sorry, lapwing, curlew and redshank, it's easy enough to find and monitor their nests. With, with snipe, it's a completely different matter. So we used uh, ter mapping territorial birds. So we had a territorial bird in, a, in an area on each of the three visits that would go down as a confirmed territory. And, and to confirm a territorial bird, there's two things. Uh, chipping, uh, which I'll just play a little snip of. So the snipe will skulk about in the bog and make that call as they're skulking about. Um, but another one is drumming. So drumming is, is fascinating. That's where they fly up in the air and do a little bit of aerial display. And they stick out these feathers. So you see the, the, the feathers between the situ situated between the tail and the wing, two very rigid tail feathers sticking out. And so they have those stick out, then they'll dive, and the air as it passes through creates this drumming sound. Um, so I'll just play that now. quite a distinctive sound um, and yeah uh, very much the sound of the heath in the forest um, so that's like but it would be rude to move on from snipe without highlighting uh, how just how adorable their youngsters are uh, we, we were fortunate enough to find a few nests and find a few youngsters as we we're moving around and they've got to be the most attractive of uh, wader young there are remarkably well camouflaged as well um, so yeah we had to be extremely careful as we were walking through the bogs uh, watching every single step um, as we went. So finally we're going to talk about red shank. Um, so red shank, 
Uh, just to clarify here, in the New Forest, we're talking about red shank that are breeding on the crown lands. Um, so we didn't survey those that are nesting at the coast. So there's many more nests at the coast. But we're just talking about the interior of the New Forest. We mapped seven territories. Uh, they all nest in, in bogs and valley mires. Uh, of those seven, none were successful. They all failed. Uh, red shank are hugely vulnerable to, to disturbance and they, they really don't help themselves either in the fact that they nest in some of the busiest places. Uh, one that I was monitoring at Hatchet Pond was, was being pestered at least on a at least on a 30 or 40 minute interval with people walking from, from a, a, a nearby area. Um, so yes, it's, it's um, quite disturbing, but uh, just a bit, bit of... I'm sure we all know what red shank sounds like, so we'll, we'll quickly move on. Um, so what we're doing as well as part of that is um, trying to do a bit of outreach, really, because to the normal people, where normal people are in the new forest, dog walkers, uh, recreational walkers and the like, just to try and highlight the plight of the curlew and what wonderful species they are. I mean, I believe it's easy to... to, to uh, get frustrated with with folk, but I think losing your rag gets you nowhere. Uh, you're much better off winning the hearts and minds of of people and 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 getting them to believe in how wonderful curlews and lapwings are. And much more likely to to have a care that way. Um, and so we're also working with the national park and forestry to 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 make sure certain areas are protected and fully signed. I'll just talk about these ones very quickly. I so say red pole is another species we've been monitoring hasn't bred in the new forest since 2002. So we started the survey last year. Uh, we found six pairs that we've started um, color ringing. This bird at the bottom here is a lovely adult male uh, that was uh, color ringed in July uh, at Duck Hole. Um, and also part of what we're doing, we're monitoring ravens. Um, so ravens are one of those species that could have an impact on our ground nesting waders. Uh, Ravens are a species we're all talking about at the moment, um, but we don't really have a full grip of what's going on and where they are, what their numbers are. So we started the survey last year. Um, so far we've mapped 17 pairs um, across the forest. We think that's about right, but that survey is going to carry on this, this year. And it's to do nothing more but to understand their distribution. So I'm going to talk about another couple of partner projects here. Just very quickly, wood warbler is a species that's being uh, done by a, a colleague, Tony Davis. I'm sure many people in Sussex know Tony. He does a lot of fantastic work in the New Forest with his group. So wood warbler is a species that declined quite dramatically in recent years. Um, and the graph here shows the decline here over 10 years in the New Forest. You can see how, see how numbers have, have uh, sort of fallen off, off the block, really. It's incredible how numbers have declined. Uh, they're a hard species to find now, wood warbler, in the New Forest. And it's remarkable, if you look at the bottom there, in the 80s, uh, the estimated population was 450 pairs in the New Forest. Type for time, so I'll just squeeze on past that one. Uh, we'll just talk about finding wood warbler. Uh, good places to go and find them is in mixed woodland, undulating terrain, often close to a stream. Uh, Burley New Enclosure is a good area, but I should say if you go looking for a wood warbler, be very mindful of where you're going. They're a ground nesting bird. Uh, so if you hear a wood warbler singing nearby, do stick to open ground. Don't go trumping for any uh, vegetation. Uh, be very mindful of, of what you're doing. Um, but if you want to go and find wood warbler, I would certainly do it in the next year or two, because I think they probably won't be here for all that much longer. So I'll just play a little snippet of song. Um, and one, one final, uh, nearly final species, lesser spotted woodpecker is them being uh, very well monitored by a colleague, um, Rob Clements in the New Forest is doing a sterling job along with uh, Ken Smith uh, from Sussex. Uh, so I just wanted to just highlight the work they're doing. Um, they're uh, being very active. I'll just skip past this um, and I can talk through this little video clip. Less spotted with because they're doing some great work looking for and monitoring nests to better understand what's going on with uh, less spots in the forest, their distribution and breeding success. And so this is an adult male, less spotted with pecker, you can pick it up by the red crown there. Again, apologies for the shaky video, this was just taking a handheld on a little camera of mine, uh, so it's far from professional. 
this is the female you can see by comparison uh in the chick there coming out to be fed the female has no red on her crown at all on her forehead sorry um obviously the chick prefers the female um this is one more that comes comes in but this is fairly typical area to find um less spotted woodpeckers are taking a marsh mark ash uh, the dead uh, dead tree all dead by the way um there. Uh, so yes, um, it's typical lesser spotted woodpecker habitat in the new forest, this sort of alder or beach along a sort of alder or birch along a stream, they generally find a dead one, often one that's sort of snapped uh, in half and make a nest. They, they could make a nest in a whole whole range of different tree species, but typically this is this is this is, somewhere like this would be a good place to go looking for them. Um, so if you want to find a spotted woodpecker in the forest, ancient deciduous woodland, often in damp areas close to streams, good areas of new cops and frame wood. Early mornings are best, first couple of hours of the day, I'm afraid to say, from mid-Feb through to early April. Um, I haven't heard one drumming yet this year. I've seen a couple recently though. Um, a lot of people, probably the question I get asked more than any other is, is how to differentiate lesser spot from great spot in drumming. Um, so I just quickly will quickly talk about that. Uh, lesser spot I always think of as like a World War II machine gun uh, going on and on and on, whereas a great spot is a little burst by a long gap. So I'll play the lesser spot so we can hear that that machine gun kind of style. And then by comparison, this is great spot, hard drumming, long gap, and a short drum. Uh, the, the strength of the drum, I think, doesn't really matter whether they're hard or soft, because it all depends what substrate they're drumming on. But another call to listen out for for lesser spots is the key, key, key. So if you hear that, you've, you've definitely got yourself a lesser spot. Um, we'll brush past linnet, just to focus quickly on a non-avian subject, very quickly, uh, uh, where we're catching hawfinches, we run trail cameras. And back in 2016, I was amazed uh, to pull this little clip of footage off of my trail camera uh, in the middle of the forest. This is, fortunately, it's an American date. It's actually the 12th of March, not the 3rd of December. Uh, but this is a pine martin. Uh, so there's one little other quick clip we can show, and this is the first recorded incidence of, of, uh, of the first um, footage of pine martin ever captured in, in the New Forest. Uh, and it kept on visiting over subsequent days, um, eating eating my hawfinch seeds, uh, but I think we can forgive him that. Uh, and that has uh, been a catalyst for, for quite a lot of pine martin field work subsequently, so I'm quite heavily involved in pine martins now. And, this year in particular is going to be a big a big push on pine martin field work. Uh, but thank you. I apologise for, for overrunning a little bit there. Um, well, Marcus, to... thanks very much indeed. That was absolutely brilliant. And um, it's clear to me that you could have talked for um, another hour and, and entertained us as well as you have done um, for the last 40 minutes or so. I'm going to go straight over to... Um, We've got Maya Bambrick, who some of you may know as uh, an ambassador of the Cameron Bospolka Trust. We may know him, know her from other things. Um, she's here to host the Q&A, and I can see there have been some really good questions. So over to you, Maya. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Marcus, for that wonderful talk. That was really interesting. Uh, we had lots and lots of questions, uh, but I've picked out a few, but the rest will be available. The answers will be available on the SOS website in the next few days, so you can catch up on them then. Uh, but the first question I thought I might ask would be, why have firecrests increased in numbers so dramatically? I think there's a mixture of reasons for that. I think uh, primarily that they they have big broods uh, and they seem to be successful. Um, so the youngsters seem, seem to have a good survival rate. Uh, also, we've had a long run of very mild winters. And so, so goldcrests and firecrests can be impacted by harsh winter weather. Um, but... <clears throat> This, I mean, we've had a few cold spells this winter, but generally we've had a mild run of winters and I think that's really helped them. Um, so we haven't, haven't had the, the, the crashes that you might expect in, in colder winters. Thank you. Um, someone asked, how do you know that there are a few different birds singing, not the same one, that was the firecrest? 
Ah, uh, because we, we, we map them. Uh, so we, we plot them in a map. So and it started off by studying Firecrest. So uh, in a lot of backgrounds, uh, we study individuals. So we get to understand how they use their territory. And so Firecrest are very territorial and they'll stay within their defined territory. So um, they tend not to move. You might occasionally get an unmated bird roving and singing, um, but in the, in the preceding years, we did do a lot of work with individual singing firecrest, and that gave us the confidence that when you have a singing firecrest, you're moving quickly through the woods. So you're, you're, you're recording one and moving on, recording another. And so you, you build, up a, build up a picture, I suppose. So it, it's not ever, that sort of field work is never gonna be 100%, but I, I would say we're within plus or minus 10% of the figure with that kind of data that we're generating. Mm, that's very interesting. That makes sense. Uh, any reasons why the firecrest prefer soft conifers to other trees? Is it cover? I suspect it is cover, yes, uh, because it, uh, they're spread out from the soft conifers a, a little bit, but they're adopting areas of, of holly and yew uh, much more. So it is, I think they do like that sheltered environment more so than goldcrests, where goldcrests seem happier to be a little bit more exposed. Uh, so moving on to about the hawfinch, someone asked, do they have a hierarchy on the way they gather on trees? Wow, that's a good question. And that's not one I, I think it was one that would be difficult to answer. Uh, but I don't think so. Um, so I've watched them not gathered in trees, but I've watched colour ringed birds that I know quite well, a lot feeding on the ground. And no, there doesn't appear to be any dominant individuals. Females are more dominant than males, certainly when they're feeding. Um, and hawfinches are far more dominant than the other species in the area, other than maybe a great spotted woodpecker or a jay might come in and upset them. But amongst other finches, hawfinches are the most dominant. But I'm sure there is a pecking order within the birds, but it's not that obvious. Brilliant. Um, someone asked, is it, why, is it known why the population of hawfinches are declining? Uh, no, there, there's a lot of theories and uh, that's part of the reasons why we're doing this work. So initially we thought it was poor breeding productivity, um, but work to date suggests that probably isn't the case. Hawfinches are long-lived birds, so they can afford to have a few bad years and still continue to be productive. Um, so it's not 100% clear and I, I, I think it's a mixture, probably like a lot of these things, I think it's a mixture of different reasons creating a perfect storm. Um, habitat availability probably being a key one of those and food availability as well. And quite similar to that question, someone asked how many hawfinches are there in the new forest? Well, I kind of changed my mind on that almost daily, but um, I think it's it's between 300 and 350 pairs in the new forest. Wow, that's pretty good. Uh, someone asked, how do you glue tags onto birds' backs? Okay, it's uh, super glue. Uh, and what we do, we, um, we get a little bit of um, deionized water and we wet the back of the bird ever so slightly, the area we wanted to separate out the feathers and we select a single feather and we glue it, a little dab of glue onto the shaft of the feather. Uh, so it doesn't touch the skin, uh, it's, on, it's on the shaft of the feather. Uh, and someone asked, what is the current situation with pine martins in the new forest? Well, that's the million dollar question that we, we hope to maybe answer this year. So we're doing survey work this year. Uh, we haven't finalised all the details yet. The true answer is we don't know. They're more widespread than we thought they were, that's for sure, based on trail camera and uh, road casualties have been picked up but uh, we've been tasked to try and assess what their spread and number is. They're a very hard species to survey for but uh, yeah watch this space maybe next year we might have an answer. <laughs> Thank you and someone asked is there any survey work being done on raptor persecutions in the new forest? Raptor persecutions? Uh, uh, Population, diamond. I mean. Population, oh yeah, yes there is. Uh, so I, I kind of intentionally don't talk about raptors in my talk, but just because it's quite a contentious subject to mm. occasionally. But um, yes, there's work done on honey buzzard and goshawk and hobby. Uh, so there's a lot of work goes on by a small number of very dedicated individuals. Uh, and it wouldn't be fair of me to steal their thunder, but they're doing a, a fantastic job. 
Uh, and we've had a question in um, it's asking what are the likely reasons for the decline of the wood warbler? Well, okay, that's, that's another good question. And, and that's, that's one, again, that there's a lot of theories about. Uh, the, the chief among them are food availability. So insect prey availability at the breeding site, we, uh, combined with possibly with a mismatch of emergence and, and breeding time. Um, and that's sort of held out by uh, studies that have been done at the nest, finding that wood warblers have been bringing in all sorts of random prey items that they probably shouldn't. But that's combined with the fact they're very heavily predated and you forest their nests are generally exposed and they, they have a, a long cast of species that would predate them. Uh, but there's also theories about what's going on in their wintering areas as well. And so th there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of areas where we're kind of close to understanding it, but a bit more work needs doing yet. And someone's put in the chat, could you expand a bit, uh, a bit more on where you think, on where you think five, could you expand a bit on where you think firecrest winter. We have a small population in northwest Norfolk, which is declining a bit, but winter records are rare, even in what mild winters. Okay, so I can only really comment from, from our neck of the woods, because uh, I hardly ever leave the New Forest, but um, in our area, they, they never used to winter in the Central Forest. They do much more so now, but still probably only 20% of our breeding population stays to winter in the New Forest. And, and those that are, are not wintering in the forest tend to move out we believe to the local coastal areas. So uh, where I am here in Lymington, also Southampton, uh, there's a large population of firecrest in places like Southampton Common. Um, you can go for a walk, uh, certainly here locally, uh, and find firecrests in almost every hedgerow. So we, we, we think a large proportion of them move out into like, these urban heat pockets. Uh, so like I say, in, in my local town, you, you go to places like the local park or, um, even our garage has got a, a Douglas next to it and there's, there's firecrest in there. I hear them after wow. the car. Um, so I think they're not moving that far. That's, that's also supported by the fact that they, they generally don't leave the forest in number until November and they're generally back in February. So they can't be going very far in that short time. And someone asked quite a tricky question. Uh, what can be done about predator control? Blimey. Uh, <laughs> well, what, what I would say is what we do at Wild New Forest is we get the data uh, and present the data as it is and we try not to get too involved in making those decisions because predator control is such a such a contentious subject and and you can argue you know which which predators uh, so foxes are controlled in the New Forest um, uh, to a degree uh, and you could argue maybe more needs doing um, but it's yeah it's, it, that's a very difficult one to answer, and so I'm going to have to sit on the fence, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Be a coward. Uh, don't blame you. Um, what is the difference between a male roost site and a nest site? That's for the whole finches. So, well, with the with the bird I was talking about, IP, he was nesting, the nest was in a, an, an ivy-clad oak, and he was roosting in an, in an identical oak next to it. Uh, so with that, I should have explained, with that GPS tag, we set it to do a recording at one o'clock in the morning. So they would pick up their roost where they're roosting. Um, but the majority of off-duty or, or, or males that are breeding males roost communally in the traditional roosts um, separate from the nest. Um, so the male, their job is to provide for the nest. So they, they tend not to hang around the nest all that much other than to bring food for the female or for the chicks. All the rest of the time they're out foraging or roosting in, in their associated roosts. So we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, what are the reasons for curlew decline over the last 20 years? Okay, that's a good question. And so I, I think, again, like a lot of these, it's, it's a multifaceted answer. There's, there's a lot of reasons why, uh, but chiefly among those is, is predation. Uh, so we, we long thought that recreational disturbance was a big issue. And I, I believe recreational disturbance is still an issue, but it's not as big as we thought it was. Uh, predation is a bigger issue. Um, in, so, oh, I can't remember now, 2016, 2017, we set up uh, temperature loggers in nests, we put in nests, and that records the temperature of a nest. And so when a nest is predated, obviously the, it loses the temperature and records the time. So we could work out when they were being predated. And, and the majority of curlews that were predated at that time were 
predated overnight. Uh, so that, that limits the number of suspects that could be doing the predation event. Uh, we, we believe the majority of them are box. I'm sure Badger has a role to play as well. Um, that's one part. And the other part of it, I think, is, is the recreational disturbance. And I'm not saying that people walking are going to sort of destroy a curly nest, but what is happening is in these busy areas, next to busy car parks, uh, the curlews are coming in to select their nesting territory and they're losing big chunks of the forest as an option because they're so busy. So the curlews are forced or whatever way the species it is, are forced to choose less suitable sites um, either maybe because they're close to a woodland edge and therefore more likely to get predated or whatever the reason might be. But these, these um, recreational activities are, are, are pushing them. The, the, the quieter areas of the forest are getting fewer and fewer, which means giving the birds less choice of where to nest. Um, and so that, that is a big issue. And obviously, you know, dog, dog walking, uh, dog walking isn't a problem in, as such. We, we've, we've got records of a curlew nesting quite close to a path where people would go past with dogs off of leads. And as long as the people and the dogs stayed on the same trajectory and went past, the curlews weren't bothered. But every now and then you get a dog that go running off the path and that was it. That's when the curly would be up. Now, the dog wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily do anything to the curly nest, but you can guarantee there'll be a raven or a crow nearby who know exactly where that nest is and spot that curly is not on the nest. And that's, that's, that's when they get hammered. And so, yeah, there's, there's lots of different reasons. Another one I could talk all day about, I'm afraid. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I think our last question of the night um, is, was the see them in the next two years for wood warblers a prediction of their decline in the new forest or the UK? Oh, that's new forest. Very much new forest. So I, I yeah, I'm not saying they'll be gone from the new forest in, in two years time, but I think they'll be an awful lot harder to find. Um, so yes. I'll, I'll Thank you very awesome. much. Okay, thank, thanks, Maya, and, and thanks again, Marcus. I think you're going to have an awful lot of people heading for the heading for the new forest as soon as lockdown eases. Um, somebody also asked whether this talk is going to be on the SOS YouTube channel. It should be uh, sometime tomorrow if I get the technology right. Um, the next talk we've got in this series is on saving Sussex's swift, uh, which is a week, a week today. Um, so if you enjoyed the talk, do consider joining or making a donation to the Sussex Ornithological Society or indeed the Hampshire Ornithological Society uh, or indeed Wild New Forest. I'm sure Marcus would welcome that very much indeed. So, Marcus, thank you so much indeed. You know, we could have had you talking for another hour, I know, but very much appreciated. We'd all give you a big clap, but uh, uh, you, you can't hear the attendees. So thank you again. And enjoy thank the you. Really big, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.